Morning, guys. It's time for another semi-impromptu live stream. So I feel like oftentimes when I make these uh, these uh, streams answering questions and I kind of get a flood of questions from people on my Patreon. So it's kind of nice because it uh, gives me fresh ideas for, for some content. So I got a question actually just last night after my other stream from one of my Patreon people, and that is... Uh, Jason, who Jason has asked other questions in the past that I've addressed. And uh, this is kind of an interesting one. And one, this is a topic I've never touched on at all, really, on this channel. So he writes, did doctors in the Middle Ages really bleed people? And did this result in deaths for patients? Thanks for your content, Jason. All right. Thanks very much, Jason. Okay, so yeah, medieval medicine, uh, pretty interesting subject. Um, so, okay, bloodletting. Yes, bloodletting was practiced uh, by um, medical practitioners in the medieval world, uh, but not just the medieval world. It was a widely practiced uh, procedure from the classical era, so from classical Greece, really up until the 19th century. So it's it's kind of remarkable how how long this this was done but there are a lot of misconceptions about it um okay what's the hollywood image again that we we always get in movies they always will show uh you know somebody's sick and some uh, crazy quack doctor comes in and like cuts a big you know opening on their arm and just starts bleeding them out into uh, a bowl and they're laying there kind of uh you know just dying basically like basically this this guy's bleeding them out that's um that's very much an exaggeration that is not how uh, bleeding was practiced um okay so first of all why was it practiced well uh as a lot of you may know bleeding was based on the idea of the uh, system of humors so this is uh the greek theory of bodily humors so this goes back to ancient greek medicine uh, one thing we have to remember about uh, the medieval world is there was a lot of respect for classical learning uh, when it came to medicine, especially um, the practitioners really referred back to to classical knowledge. Uh, this was both in the uh, the Muslim world and in the Christian world. Uh, there was just a lot of respect for these Greek uh, Greek texts and Greek uh, authors who wrote about medicine at the time. And uh, this meant that the humor system, the system of bodily humors, was the accepted view of how, uh, of how the human body worked. Now, the thing that's interesting about medieval learning is that there were kind of two impulses in the medieval era. And especially the earlier back we go, there's this impulse to compile classical knowledge. So there was this real focus on not so much coming up with new things, but... Um, compiling knowledge from the classical era and uh, focusing on that. But as time went on, there became more of an emphasis on um, new methods, uh, exploring new ideas, especially as we get into the 12th century and then the 13th century, it really takes off. Um, and really, this is uh, where experimental science really gets going, is, uh, is, is in the high Middle Ages. And a lot of it had to do with this clash between people who were strict classicists, if you will, especially people who were strict Aristotelians, people who said, you know, whatever Aristotle said, that's, that's the thing, right? But then you had these other guys coming up who were, who were questioning Aristotle, who were reevaluating his work, uh, who, who were starting to do experiments. Um, uh, of course, Jean Beridon is a classical example of that, uh, somebody we can, we can think about uh, as, as uh, experimental science kind of comes into being. But, okay, so what was this Greek theory of bodily humors? Well, you've got four humors, right? You've got blood, which was considered to be hot and wet. And this produced a sanguineous personality, which is kind of similar to the type of personality we think of when we think of uh, some, when we call somebody sanguine today. That's another interesting thing. A lot of these terms are kind of still in use, or, or, st or we still uh, refer to them. It's, it's a, a relic of uh, this past medieval 
uh, sister, really I should say ancient system because the medieval system of medicine was really just the ancient system of medicine. So yeah, blood was hot and wet and a sanguinous personality was ruddy, cheerful, warm and generous. So this is uh, kind of more how you wanted uh, your patient to turn out. And then there was phlegm, which was cold and wet. And the phlegmatic personality was uh, detached and cool. Uh, we still, again, use that term today. Uh, in medieval uh, representations, the sanguinous personality was often shown as a knight who was, uh, you know, high spirited and uh, uh, generous with his his vassals. Generosity was a huge uh, was considered to be a huge uh, important quality of, of the nobility at this time. And hold on one second. And then our third humor is yellow bile. This was hot and dry, and this produced a choleric personality. And again, these, the way this worked is the humors, if you were balanced toward one of these substances, and they believed that being a little bit sanguinous was actually good, but if you were balanced towards one of these, that would create an illness. So if you were choleric, you were hot and dry. I think about this, like a, um, an illness like cholera, uh, you know, you get somebody who's feverish, who's, um, uh, who's, who's suffering from a high fever and is in a lot of discomfort. You can see, you know, how this is what they thought was going on. They thought this, this was an imbalance of yellow bile in them. Um, uh, choleric people were thought to be irritable, thin and agitated. They were thin because they were always anxious. Uh, black bile is the is the fourth humor. Uh, this was cold and dry. So this produced a melancholic personality, which you know we still use the term mel melancholy. So you would be gloomy and depressed. So okay, what would a medieval physician do when they would encounter a patient? Well, they would look at all these elements that could contribute to an imbalance of humors and uh, medieval medical texts, which are based basically very strictly on these uh, classical texts, they would talk about this stuff. Like you look at the person's food, you look at their environment, you look at uh, the direction that they are facing. Uh, is, there, is there a breeze passing over them? From which direction is it coming? What sort of clothing are they wearing? Um, astrology. What's going on with the astrological formations, uh, the, the zodiac? Uh, astrology was not uh, just like a form of, of divination or um, a kind of sorcery or something like that in the Middle Ages. It was a, considered a legitimate science pretty much everywhere. Uh, the Byzantines, the Muslims, the Latin Christians, everybody was interested in astrology. And um, the formations of uh, the heavens uh, could tell you, you know, information you needed to know about what to do. Um, it, it's, it's kind of striking some of this stuff from medieval medicine, like, okay, let's say somebody is melancholic, they're cold and dry, they've got an excess of, of black bile. Uh, some information in medieval medical texts could be useful, like they might say, okay, well, then you need to have nice, warm, cozy clothing, you need to, um, uh, drink like uh, some, a nice warm soup. You need to stay away from uh, a draft or cold chills. You know, to, the, to us, this is just kind of basic uh, stuff. I mean, you don't really need to be a doctor to understand this, but, um, but for them, I mean, this is the kind of thing they would do and you can see how, okay, well, that actually would probably be helpful. On the other hand, there was some stuff that would just probably not really be relevant, but to them it was like, for example, okay, well, you're, you're melancholic. You've got too much black bile. Okay. Well then you need to not, um, uh, or no, this would actually be for phlegma phlegmatic. I'm sorry. If you're phlegmatic, you're cold and wet, right? Okay. So you need to avoid cold and wet foods, fish, you know, fish, they swim around in the cold waters. They're, they're wet. 
don't eat any fish. Um, you know, that's going to help rebalance your humors. Now, of course, we know now that would do nothing, but, um, but some, but again, some of the other ideas that would come out of this could be helpful. Um, one thing is just, uh, it would often encourage somebody to eat a more balanced diet. Um, one of the problems that commonly, uh, medieval physicians would come up with was, okay, well, you're eating too much of this. You know, one of the things that a medieval physician would do would be to look around the environment. Okay, well, this person's eating nothing but this. You're eating an excess of that. It's creating the imbalance of humors. You need to eat more of this or more of these fruits or vegetables or whatever it might be. And that would help correct the imbalance. Okay, so, um, and all this influenced how... Uh, how bleeding was used too, right? So um, you would look at the per particular patient. And just to go back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of how bleeding was practiced, the thing they often show in movies is um, just these, this l really intense flow of blood just pouring out of the person. This is not how bleeding was practiced. The medieval texts talk about making a very small incision, um, the the rate of flow has to be very slow and from everything we can tell the amount of blood they actually took out was probably negligible uh it was it was not a significant amount of blood really i mean we're probably talking about uh, 10 mils uh, uh something like that uh, it the funny thing about it is it probably is not that uh unlike what it's like today when a patient's in the hospital and they get frequent blood draws. Um, you know, if you've ever had a loved one who's, who's been in the ICU or something like that, you know that, uh, you know, the nurse is constantly coming in there uh, wanting, needing blood samples because they're, they're redoing lab work. Um, but yeah, the amount of blood taken probably did not really have an effect on, on the patient. Uh, Bloodletting was probably basically pointless in 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 the middle ages and that's probably about as as bad as it was <clears throat> the idea that people were just being bled out is 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 inconsistent um with uh you know with uh, how how this actually worked um there were very specific ideas about the circumstances for bleeding some patients it was forbidden to bleed them pregnant women uh small children very old people, people who were particularly weak. That's kind of interesting. Um, they also understood that bleeding could make people feel weaker for a while. And so there was a strict idea about the recovery period. Um, there were certain times when you weren't supposed to bleed. Hot weather was thought to produce weakness in people. And so you didn't bleed uh, a patient when the weather was hot. Also, during a new moon, you were not to bleed a patient. This was also supposed to be a time that produced weakness in people. Astrological signs were very important in determining uh, the location and timing of bleeding. Uh, there's a lot of interesting texts. Um, there's some really interesting Arab texts that talk about uh, the different veins and the location for where, uh, you know, what particular humor, humoral imbalances call for what for which vein should be opened and that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, you know, the doctor would look at uh, astrological signs and uh, that would help determine when there was going to be bleeding or if there was going to be bleeding as well. So... So, um, there, were also, there was also uh, limitations placed on how often a person could be bled. Generally, it was around once a month was thought to be, um, was thought to be uh, a good timing. Uh, some texts say every three months. Uh, we, and we don't really have records of like, okay, well, this person was bled, then they died. Um, there was a there was a sense medieval physicians and, and medical practitioners did understand that bleeding could cause somebody to die, and so they were very careful about you know the size of the cut they made, 
and uh, there was there was a lot of training in how to stop the bleed once uh, the bleeding had been made. But yeah, I mean, it was it, it, it was a pointless practice. I mean, there there were there were some there was some speculation at one point um, that maybe there there were some health benefits to this, like. Uh, Maybe, uh, I can't remember what it was, but there was something in the 70s where they were doing some investigations where they thought that maybe reducing the iron content could actually have a negative impact on the, uh, the pathogen that was infecting the person. Like it could reduce the amount of iron that was accessible to whatever it was that was the organism that was infecting the person. But we, we now are pretty sure that that's, you know, that's, that's probably bunk as well. Um, but I mean, you know, the, the, the humoral system, which existed for so long in, uh, in, you know, human civilization, uh, it was, it was based on incorrect information <clears throat> and, you know, there were some things about it that, that, uh, there were some, some practices that could be helpful. A lot of this probably resulted more from, uh, well, okay. And that's the thing that we are not sure about, right? is where did a lot of these ideas come from? Like the idea of, okay, well, you're, you're cold and wet, you're phlegmatic, so we need to bundle you up and, you know, whatever. I mean, that's just kind of an obvious thing. I mean, if you didn't know anything about the humoral system and, you know, you were just a caveman or something, you might know that it helps your, your sick uh, buddy if you uh, wrap them up in, a, in, in something warm and cozy and you uh, keep them out of the rain and stuff like that. I mean... But we don't really know, you know, we're, we're, what, what were the origins of a lot of these, these practices? Was it like, uh, okay, over time, as people did these medical practices, they saw what helped, and so then they rationalized it into the humoral system, or was it taken directly out of the humoral theory and then, uh, you know, and, it was, and then applied, and then that's how it came about? Um, I tend to think probably a lot of it was the former. Um, one thing we have to remember, too, is that doctors, like trained physicians, were not the only people practicing uh, medical or healing arts at this time. Um, for example, uh, uh, barbers also doubled as surgeons, and barbers were people who could, uh, who would be called upon to, to uh, perform a bloodletting. Now, this, <laughs> this is kind of a, something that kind of makes people, you know, uh, weirds people out when they hear about this now, but it wasn't like, you know, the barber was some drunken guy with, uh, who, who brought in his, his hair cutting shears or his, uh, his shaving knife and just started like hacking away at your loved one. These barbers were trained. It was like a dual type of training and they would have had separate equipment for, um, you know, for, for when they were, uh, you know, shaving, shaving dad's beard to when they were, uh, they were doing a bloodletting and, um, and they and they had the same type of training that other practitioners would have had. They would have known, you know, about uh, uh, that it was important to make, uh, you know, uh, these small cuts and that kind of thing. And um, uh, and of course, quackery was a, a thing in the in the Middle Ages. And you know, we there there were uh, strong regulations and efforts in place to uh, to keep quacks from practicing. And you know, if, if you were somebody who if you were reckless and you were doing things that was that was killing people, you would very quickly probably not not only lose your ability to practice, but probably lose uh, um, your your life too. Uh, this was oftentimes a capital offense to uh, to recklessly practice, uh, you know, medicine that resulted in people uh, being killed. So, yeah, okay. And one last thing is that probably the vast majority of people probably never experienced bleeding. Um, Bleeding would have been something that would have only been available to the wealthier elements of society. To, so to certain elements of the nobility and the clergy. And then some people, um, uh, you know, yeah, some people were probably, if, if you were just a villager or something like that, you probably would have never encountered this. Uh, you wouldn't have had access to that kind of medical care. Uh, you know, unlucky for you, right? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh, oh yeah, one last thing I wanted to, to hit on. Um, so, okay, we talked about you know doctors, barber surgeons. Uh, also, there was just kind of folk, uh, folk medical practitioners. So 
maybe the local woman who knew a lot about herbs that were helpful, who had experience with, uh, with tending to the sick. And so she gathered a certain amount, he or she, whoever, you know, gathered a certain amount of knowledge, um, you know, to help take care of uh, local people who are sick. And then also uh, there were uh, noble women who, who kind of seemed to have gotten, gotten an interest in this and uh, done something with it. Of course, the university trained physicians were all men. Mostly they were, uh, they were probably from a clerical background, but um, <clears throat> because of their wealth and position, noble women could, uh, had access to some of this learning. And there is some evidence that uh, some noble women would kind of take this up and, you know, in their household, like taking care of their children or their family members, they would have you know, looked into some of this and would have got, gotten some skill in this. And so in particular families, you would have had situations where, oh, okay, well, Isabella, she really knows a lot about this stuff. Uh, uh, Uncle Odo is sick. Let's, let's call her. She can take a look at him, you know, something like that. So anyway, uh, kind of an interesting subject. I'm, I'm glad we got to talk about this today. Uh, bloodletting uh, in, in medieval medical practices. I'm going to jump over to the chat and say hi to you guys. Real quick here. Let's see who's in there. Oh, Eric Rogers asked if they use leeches. Very good question. Um, very rarely. This is actually another thing I think that Hollywood kind of uh, gets wrong often. They often like to show, you know, a leech being used. There is some evidence of this, but it was very, very infrequent. Uh, not something that. Um, not something that we have evidence for, much evidence for at all really happening. Um, <laughs> Marion Graham says, only the rich could afford to be killed by medical doctors in those days. Okay, again, like I was saying earlier, earlier, it's very tempting for us. You know, we live in an age of incredible medical science, and uh, we're very lucky for that. Um, and so it's very easy for us to look back on medicine from the ancient world, the medieval world, and the early modern world, quite frankly, because again, bleeding was practiced from the classical times to the 19th century, so well beyond the Middle Ages. It's easy for us to look back and say, wow, what a bunch of lunatics. I mean, they must have been going around killing, these doctors just were butchers killing people. That's not the case. I mean, let's be, let's be, and I think you were joking, you know, you know, but just in terms of uh, understanding the era, we, we, we shouldn't imagine that like the doctor shows up and oh, oh man, somebody's going to die. I mean, that's really not how, um, like I was saying, bloodletting probably at worst, it was probably mostly useless, like probably a lot of medical practices at this time. It probably did nothing to the person. Um, the amount of blood that was taken was so small that, you know, it was, it was not something that was going to bleed somebody out. So Okay. Harold Balder asks, how did one become a doctor? Was there a doctor's guild? Well, basically it was taught at universities. So you would, um, you would study it kind of, kind of like today. I mean, you would, and you would be licensed, uh, to, to practice medicine, uh, through your university training. So. Okay. Eric Rogers is asking about, uh, herbal, remedies. It was a huge part of medieval medicine. Absolutely. Um, uh, physicians would have had training in it. Um, and uh, yes, like you're saying, kind of the folk practitioners, which were a huge part of medieval medicine, you know, uh, to most people, that would have been who who practiced medicine on you or, or where you got uh, medical treatment would have been from kind of a local person who had knowledge of this stuff through experience, through practice. And yeah, I mean, Herbs and plants were, this was a big part of how uh, medical conditions were treated. And um, I mean, this has had an impact on us today. I mean, a lot of medicines to this day are derived from, from the use of plants. And so I think that, you know, a lot of these herbal remedies were probably helpful. So, all right. All right. Well, this has just been a... Uh, a brief little stream here for you guys. So I'm glad we got to talk about bloodletting in the Middle Ages, a very, uh, very fascinating topic. So I will talk to everybody soon. Have a good morning.